Most people are not aware of it or haven't thought very carefully about it because it doesn't seem to matter to us. This is getting to be so serious that we are reaching a cathartic moment, and I do think it started. Let's just look at the numbers first. M2 growth peaked at 27% in 2020 and has been slowing ever since. We believe it is closing in or might be below 3% on a year-over-year basis, uh, which doesn't leave a lot of room for growth or inflation unless velocity is really picking up the rate at which money turns over. And we're in an environment where we do not believe velocity is picking up. If anything, I think individuals and businesses are becoming more concerned and are spending less freely. If you look at M2 also, you'll see that it actually peaked in March. Now, this is very unusual to see sequential declines in money. We have not gotten back above that March peak, and we may not get back above it the way that Fed policy is going. And I think uh, I'd like to build the case a little more here that the Fed is probably making a mistake. I say probably because I have to from a compliance point of view, but I really do believe the Fed is making a mistake. And reflecting a little bit more on the Jackson Hole speech that Chairman Powell gave in late August, we've come to recognize that Chairman Powell really does think he is the reincarnation of Chairman Volcker, that we need him to take a sledgehammer to inflation, much like Volcker did. And history has treated Chairman Volcker very kindly. He did turn the tide on inflation. Now, what he did, though, was he turned a tide that had been building for 15 years. It started in 1964 with the Vietnam War and with the Great Society. So many social programs started at that time under President Johnson. And for 15 years, fiscal and monetary policy pretty much went rogue as we look at history. Even after shocks to the system, like the oil embargo and the stimulus that came about because of it, both monetary and fiscal policy, we never saw the kind of slowdown in monetary and fiscal policy that we're seeing right now. Federal spending is still down 14% on a year-over-year basis. You never saw a decline in fiscal policy spending in the 70s. Monetary policy seemed to be on automatic pilot back then. The dollar was getting crushed toward the end of the 70s, adding to the inflationary fire. So Chairman Volcker did choke off money supply and killed inflation. It took a long time for people to believe that inflation had peaked. In fact, I don't think many people believe it peaked as it did in 1981 until 1986 when oil prices crashed. So the inflation expectations were embedded in the system and it was very difficult and Volcker did a masterful job. So that was over a 15-year period that inflation had built. By the time the Fed got around to tackling it this time, it was not a 15-year problem. It was a 15-month problem. And from our point of view, it was caused primarily by shocks, major shocks to the system that we had never seen before. We had not had, since Spanish influenza, a global pandemic. And we did not have the supply chain problems, two years worth of them, that we had because of the COVID panic. And then, of course, we had another shock to top those off, and that was Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So these are shocks to the system. This was not a period of embedding inflation expectations. And yet, Chairman Powell is taking a sledgehammer that is actually bigger, much bigger, It's at least six times bigger right now and could be eight to ten times bigger if the Fed does raise the Fed funds rate. And what do I mean by that? Well, Chairman Volcker was dealing with double-digit interest rates. He took interest rates from 10% to 20%. Now, by the time he did that, consumers and businesses had gotten used to maneuvering around inflation. 
While that sounds shocking going from 10 to 20%, and it did have some shock value, it wasn't the same as what we're experiencing today with Chairman Powell and the Fed. Today, we've gone from 0.25% on the Fed funds rate to five, not a twofold increase. Now, many people, I was interviewed by someone the other day and said, oh, yeah, but that was such a low base. There, there's no comparison. In fact, that makes this even more dramatic. That's what's so interesting. People dismiss this way of thinking about it, saying, oh, yeah, but the base was so low. The base was so low, and it had been really since 2008 and nine because we were in a terrible crisis then, and it took a long time to get out of it. And so we did not have information inflation expectations built into the system. I really don't believe at all. And yet, Chairman Powell is behaving as though what's going on today with inflation is much worse than what Volcker inherited. Starting from a low base is really shocking the system, especially given how long interest rates have been low. So I question the premise of those who say, oh, this is so different. It's such a low base. That's the whole point. It's a low base. This will be a 16-fold increase compared to Volcker's two-fold increase. Now, we have been expecting serious ramifications, financial and other ramifications, because of this monetary policy. And we've gotten the first one, but most people here in the United States are not aware of it or haven't thought very carefully about it because it doesn't seem to matter to us. Uh, but I was in the UK around the time that it had its near Lehman moment. Near Lehman moment means the financial system implosion. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, there is something called LDI, Liability Driven Investing, and it's where pension funds match their liabilities with assets. So they will, in its pure form, they will match one for one the amount that they have to pay out to pensioners as they retire. Now, it would be great if they did match assets with liabilities completely from a safety to the system point of view, but they don't. And with banks and a very low interest rate environment, they got used to using derivatives and taking shortcuts to try and accomplish the same goal. And after a very long period of very low interest rates, I heard someone say the other day, and we were talking about this LDI crisis in the UK, that the reason it's so serious is pension fund sponsors were beginning to think and banks were beginning to think that interest rates would stay very low for a very long time, for as far as the eye could see. And that assumption was built into the kind of derivative activity they were doing. No one expected a sharp increase in interest rates. Well, once that happened, pensions began getting margin calls and they couldn't meet them. And in fact, if interest rates had gone to 8%, and I think they got to 6% over there, if they got to 8%, then according to some of the people close to that situation, whom we have consulted, then the pension system would have collapsed. But it wouldn't have really have been the pension system. What really would have collapsed if the pension funds were not meeting those margin calls, were the banks, the counterparties in this case, for these derivatives. And so the Bank of England had to step in and basically say pretty much the same thing that Draghi said, the chairman of the European Central Bank in 2011. He basically said, we're going to pull out all stops no matter what. So while the BOE had been almost forced because of currency depreciation into following our Fed with higher interest rates, this was going to cause a great deal of harm to uh, its system. And so it had to reverse its policy. So this is another reversal in policy, or it's a bit of a shift in policy. So now all of these pension funds in collaboration with the banks are deleveraging. So what do you do if you're deleveraging in an illiquid environment? All markets are experiencing duress today. I think the Fed is a big part of that. So what do you do? You sell the most liquid assets. What are those? Those are government bonds. 
And so we're seeing U.S. government bonds, which are held in pension funds abroad, being sold, even though deflationary pressures are mounting all over the place. We think this is a bit of a financial crisis, and we think we'll see it elsewhere as the Fed continues to raise interest rates, as it seems want to do. Certainly this week was full of speeches from all the Fed members, reminding everyone that they're going to take interest rates up until we get to 2% inflation. By that time, I think they will have been deleveraged and will be past the maximum pressure associated with this guilt trip. We're seeing other changes. We've seen China intervene to limit the weakening of the yuan. We've seen Japan doing the same. Now, what is that? What are they doing when they do that? Well, when Japan is trying to support its currency at 145 yen to the dollar, what it does is it sells dollars and buys back yen. Now, that's good in a way. It's doing some of what the Fed should be doing here, actually. It's providing dollar liquidity to the rest of the world. China is doing the same thing. And so we'll see what happens from here. I think this is getting to be so serious that we are reaching a cathartic moment. And I do think it started with the guilt trip. And the Fed has acknowledged that there are international ramifications to what it is doing, but it is thinking first and foremost about the U.S. This reminds me a lot of the early 80s and what happened in the early 80s. There were two accords, the uh, Louvre Accord and the Plaza Accord, where the Treasury ministers around the world all agreed to sell dollars to limit the deflationary impact on the rest of the world. And when I say deflationary impact, there are countries, sure, their currencies are falling apart, so their inflation rate looks, they look like they're in hyperinflation or heading in that direction. But they are being strangled by dollar-denominated debt that they cannot service. So this ends up being quite a deflationary situation longer term. We're wondering what in the U.S. is the weak link. Is it our pensions? We don't know. We know there are LDI strategies in the United States. They're not as leveraged as we understand, but one never knows. If not that, what are some of the weak links that we're seeing? We've been worrying about auto credit for a while now, and now we have more reason to. Yesterday, we got the Mannheim Used Car Index. It's a value index, pricing effectively. And it dropped another 3% plus. It was 4% plus decline last month. And so what we have now is the year-over-year -year increase has gone from 54% in April of 21 to minus 0.1. So there you go, Fed. There's another indication that deflation is in the system. That index peaked in January and is now down 14% just since January. It's declining at more than a 20% rate. Now, why is this important? Well, a lot of auto paper out there makes assumptions or the investors make assumptions about the residual values of cars. And those residual values have been going up, maybe not as much as the used car index, but they have been firm. If we're right, the used car price index is going to collapse here. Why? Well, many people bought cars during COVID because they wanted to avoid mass transit. Under normal conditions, they didn't need that car. Nonetheless, they were quite happy to see used car prices going up with the thought that when the coast is clear, they would sell back into the market, into the used car market. And as I mentioned, used car prices were up 54% on a year-over-year -year basis at one point. Now they're flat to down. And now dealers who were paying too much for used cars are sitting on losses. And they are going to have to disgorge those inventories because inventories cost money to carry, especially as interest rates are going up. So they're going to be forced to sell. And we believe that's already happening. And there's about a trillion dollars of auto paper. Now, this won't be a systemic risk, but because auto paper was the best performing paper during 0809, this is going to be quite a surprise to a number of investors. 
What's another weak link in the United States? Well, corporations have a lot of debt. Why do they have a lot of debt? Well, they've been catering to short-term shareholders who want them to buy back shares and don't mind that they're leveraging up to do so, or they want them to pay dividends and don't mind that they're leveraging up, becoming more indebted. Well, this is becoming a big problem for certain sectors of the economy that are in the throes of disruption, both cyclical and secular. And I think the retail sector is one of those. We remain astonished at the inventory buildup taking place out there. And the way we're looking at this now from a deflationary point of view, and you know we think that's the bigger risk now out there, is the pipeline is full of deflationary indicators, starting from commodities. And we'll get into that in a moment. <clears throat> But at the end of the pipeline, downstream at the consumer level, retailers are awash in inventories. And the latest one, pretty provocative, is Nike. And Nike is both a retailer, but it mostly sells to retail. Nike's inventories increased 44%. There were already telltale signs that the consumer was weakening. Its North American inventories were up 68%. And the inventories in transit, mostly from Asia, so they're on ships, were up 85%. You know what's going to happen. In order to clear the shelves, Nike is going to have to cut prices, and retailers will as well. And we believe this is just a microcosm of a much broader problem out there. And we think we'll see it in full force. So we took a look at the data for the last month because the Fed is saying that it's data-driven. So if it's data-driven, let's do that. If you look at the data, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you'll see that inflation came down during times when the economy was very strong. Why? It's because of productivity. Productivity growth is a byproduct, a critical byproduct, and an anti-inflationary byproduct of good, strong recoveries. Let's go to the commodity prices. Again, data-driven Fed, are you listening? We'll start with, from their peaks, we've got gold price, the gold price down 17%, copper down 30%, lumber down 73%. Think about that. Housing is collapsing. Iron ore down 45%. Infrastructure around the world has run into trouble, especially China. Corn down 17%. Silver down 29%. DRAM prices, which are chips, semiconductors, down 46%. The Baltic Freight Index down 48%. 8%. That's an indicator of supply chain issues. The Baltic Freight Dry Index, which is just for dry goods, down 65%. Oil, down 29%. And many people have been dismissing these and saying, yeah, but they went to sky high prices. You know, they're still not down on a year over year basis. That's not true anymore. Gold is down 3%. Copper is down 17%. Lumber is down 28% on a year over year basis. Corn is an exception. It is up 27%. Again, Ukraine being a big problem there. We have silver down 9%. DRAM price is down 33. Oil, oh yes, oil and corn. Oil is up 14%. It's had a big pop recently. But we do think having come down from $130 to $90, it is in a downtrend, mostly because of demand destruction. There's another kind of esoteric price out there. I remember it from my days diving deeply into economics. And it's container board prices. This gives you a sense of how tight the box market is because of a huge amount of trade taking place. So they are down 29% from their peak and about 53% from a year ago. Just taking the evidence and putting it together like this, there is a lot of data to be driving the Fed, which is what they say is happening but we don't think it's happening. I just rattled off lots of examples. So let's go to the markets and then wrap up pretty quickly here. Not much to say. Markets are selling off across the board and that's very unusual. 
It's associated with crises and more convincing evidence to us that the Fed is too tight and that it will pivot. And when it does, it will do so, we think, significantly. Now, first, it might simply be rhetoric because they always like to tee us up for what the next moves are going to be. And we haven't heard that rhetoric yet, despite all the evidence I just shared with you. But that evidence I just shared with you tells us that the Fed is going to get the message loudly and clearly somehow. And it may not be showing through in the numbers they want to see, but it will, it will. They are huge lagging indicators. They're basing policy on lagging indicators, not what they're supposed to be doing. If you take equities and bonds and look at what's happened since the peak, you will see that the loss to investors is more than twice what we saw in 0809. That's how bad this is because bonds are selling off with stocks this time. And one of the reasons for that is a seizing up of liquidity. As I mentioned, if people are facing margin calls or in financial difficulty, they're going to sell their most liquid asset. They will have no choice, especially with margin calls. Most liquid assets tend to be government bonds. And I think that's why we're seeing the backup in government bonds here, despite all of the deflationary signals in the pipeline. Interestingly, it feels like we're moving towards a cathartic moment is going to result in some financial signals that the Fed will have to pay attention to. Maybe it didn't have to pay attention to the guilt trip, but it should because it is the reason that near Lehman event happened in the UK. It is darkest before the dawn. We think the pivot is close and we certainly hope that the Fed gets away from this need for unanimity and a united front when really we have all of these Fed members and presidents for a reason to debate. And we feel that that debate is being stifled. The debate should be driven by data, but it cannot be. If it were, they would not be unanimous in their thinking right now.